Coming up on the ABS Evening News, another major step taken in preparation for the fourth landed campus of the University of the West Indies in Antigua. The government promises adequate internet services for all secondary and tertiary institutions in time for September 2018. Prestigious honors for two of the nation's most outstanding citizens. And the government asks to provide another million dollars to have Adom's building completed. The ABS Evening News begins now. The local evening news is brought to you by Natico. Local Agents, Bryson's Insurance. Good evening. It is Thursday, July 19. Welcome to the evening news here on ABS and Tigris News Authority. I am Terry Andrew. And I am Alejandra Robinson. A special welcome to our viewers joining us via our website and on Facebook Live for the national segment of the news and sports. Leader Sophia, this evening, Parliament has taken another step toward the establishment of the fourth landed campus of the University of the West Indies right here in Antigua and Barbuda. The lower house has passed a bill which gives oversight of the Antigua and Barbuda Hospitality Training Institute to the Education Ministry. Jamie Jarrett Shea has that report. All the parliamentarians seem to agree on the merits of establishing a university in Antigua and Barbuda. There is, however, some disagreement as to which side came up with the idea. The UPP proposed a university of Antigua which to include from AUA, the Antigua Barbuda Institute Technology, the Antigua and Barbuda Hospitality Institute, and the Antigua State College, and to add a speciality to it in terms of avionics. The member for all saints, Eastern St. Luke, again um, misquoted history by saying that the university was first proposed by his party. In actual fact, the Antigua Labour Party proposed the university and even had renderings done, I saw it, back in the 90s, from the late 90s. And, um, and, and well, BC spoke about it too. <clears throat> and had we won the elections in, if we hadn't broken for 10 years, we would, might have had about three universities by now. In any event, there was widespread support for the Hospitality Training Institute Amendment Bill which was laid before Parliament by Tourism Minister, the Honorable Charles Fernandez. The lion's share of the debate went to Education Minister, the Honorable Michael Brown, as he offered support for the bill, which places the Training Institute under his ministry. ABHTI focuses mainly on tourism-related areas and is intended to serve as one of the plants in the proposed university's multi-campus arrangement. The other campuses are the Islands Campus, and the Antigua and Barbuda International Institute of Technology. Mr. Speaker, the amendment to this bill in writing, it only replaces the Minister of Tourism with the Minister of Education in the definition phase. But in practice, what it does, it allows for the amalgamation of all four campuses into one overall university structure. Barbuda MP, the Honorable Trevor Walker, also expressed support for the legislation. It's a very timely bill, and it's a bill that I think makes a lot of sense, given the fact that we are consolidating these institutions. And, Mr. Speaker, it is something that I think would go a long way to assist Antigua and Barbuda in moving forward. The members also discussed the need to maintain a strong, relevant curriculum. I am Jamie J. O'Shea reporting for ABS News. Meanwhile, Education Minister the Honorable Michael Brown says there will be a single admissions board for all the institutions earmarked to constitute the UWE campus in Antigua and Barbuda. Beginning this September and evolving over time as we move closer towards having one university, what you will realize or what the public will realize is that as the university campus moves closer, rather than having to apply to ABHTI, 
then apply or apply to the Golden Grove Campus, the Antigua State College, or apply to Abbott, or apply to Five Islands. Rather, there will be a seamless, singular application process. He explains the inefficiencies of the current arrangement. Currently, each institution has its own set of fees, its own unique curriculum, sometimes doing the same set of courses or under the same umbrella, duplicating faculty as well. What this process does, Mr. Speaker, is that it brings the university system into one. Still in education, all secondary schools and tertiary institutions uh, are to have adequate internet services by the start of the new school year in September. This means bandwidth up to 100 megabits per second. However, it will require a significant capital expenditure of some $1.5 million. Minister with Responsibility for Information and Information Technology, the Honorable Melford Nicholas, provided the details at this morning's post-cabinet media briefing. The APUA has provided the bandwidth, but the question of having equipment, um, and if I may get a little specific, the, the switches and the routing environment and the, the wireless routing environment that would be required in school has to be built out. And uh, it's a question of uh, being able to get it done in as quick a manner as possible. Uh, the question would be whether or not we will go to a process of tendering. That would be a matter to be determined whether we go to a selective tendering process or based on the uh, urgency of the, the, uh, the, 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 the matter, it may require some special consideration for a wave of tender to be able to get it done in an effective time frame. But that's a matter to be determined and um, the rules governing procurement will apply and uh, the, my ministry will be tasked with the responsibility of seeing this through. A moment of pride to report this evening regarding two of the nation's finest citizens. The 2018 Queen's New Year's Honor was presented to Deputy Commissioner of Police Albert Wade and Stephen Joseph. Both men have been praised for their contributions in the fields of national security and community development, respectively. Nicola Barato was at Government House this morning for the investiture ceremony. Stephen Joseph, CEO and founder of the Bargain Center franchise in Antigua, was awarded the member of the British Empire Medal by the Queen's representative, Governor General of Antigua and Barbuda, His Excellency Sir Rodney Williams. The investiture ceremony was held on Thursday at Government House. Joseph was one of two recipients who opted to receive the medal at home here in Antigua instead of one of the many palaces in the UK. His Excellency Sir Rodney Williams commended the recipients for their distinguished contribution and stressed on its importance for nation building. It is important not only to acknowledge the contributions of our honorees, but also to give public recognition for their efforts in, giving, in going above and beyond the call of duty to help build our nation. It is our hope that you will treasure the insignia presented as a symbol of Her Majesty's agreement of our gratitude for your distinguished contribution to the people of our beloved Twin Island nation. I say congratulations to you all on behalf of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the nation of Antigua and Barbuda. Stephen Joseph received the member of the British Empire Medal for his contribution to business and community development. During his acceptance speech, the former science teacher, who would later evolve into the head of the Bargain Center group of companies, says support was crucial and giving back is essential. But of the good people of, this, of Antigua, we would not have been able to do what we have done over the years. We are thankful to this country. It has given us the opportunity to start from nothing and to establish a group of companies that is there to challenge anyone. If it wasn't for the good support of
all of our Antiguan friends, we would not have been able to do that. So we'll continue to give back, we'll continue to be supportive, and we still look forward to your continued support. Albert Wade Sr. enlisted in the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda in 1982. In 2018, with 36 years of policing under his belt, he is now Deputy Commissioner and Superintendent of Prisons. He received the Queen's Police Medal for his contribution to national security and public safety. By the oath of office, I pledge my allegiance not only to the police force, but more importantly, to the nation and people of Antigua and Barbuda. That oath, and no mere words, devoid of meaning. It means that I will undertake never, in any circumstances, to allow my own private interests to deter me from my fundamental task and purpose, the service to this nation and its people. And by people, I mean all without exception, even those with whom I may be in conflict. The superintendent of prisons acknowledged those who paved the way forward and recognized the past recipients of the Queen's Police Medal. He gave thanks and praise to his family, friends, and colleagues for their continued support. Nicola Barito, ABS News. Also here for us, the government is being asked to provide a further $1 million to complete the Adams building on Factory Road. The cabinet discussed the issue yesterday and remains deeply concerned about the cost overruns and delays on the project. Information Minister the Honorable Melford Nicholas says a review will be carried out and action taken if individuals are found to have run afoul of established procedures. We get our report on this this evening from Garfield Burford. Ground broken in 2013 for a facility that according to cabinet should have cost $17 million and been finished in under two years. Over four years on, the cabinet says the costs have ballooned to close to $30 million and another million is now being requested to complete the project by the end of this year. I asked Minister Nicholas whether the cabinet is confident this additional funding will see the project to completion this time. It is a totally unsatisfactory position. It is not the, um, the way that we would like to see public projects being executed in the future. And um, we have had no choice. It was a deck of cards that we had and we had to play it out. But um, hopefully this would be the last um, request for, for, for additional funding to complete the project. Even as the cabinet seeks to have the building completed, he says a thorough review will be needed to pinpoint the fault lines on the project started under the previous administration. The most I can say that the, the problems that were associated with the Adams building were built into the original design. The reason why we're in this problem with uh, cost overrun has a lot to do with the original design that was done. And so it had bound to, to lead to this. And needless to say, the cabinet's patient has been worn thin um, with respect to this. And I think at the end of it all, we have no choice but to forge ahead until we get it to a completion. But there has to be a thoroughgoing uh, review of that process. It doesn't stop there. It won't only be an academic exercise, but action could be taken against individuals if the review finds breaches of established procedures. We would not want to stop the project even at this stage to be able to engage in uh, the type of um, even forensic audit may be necessary to be able to, to accomplish that. But um, I can assure you that um, there is as much interest in the cabinet to ensure that we, we get to a thorough understanding of what happens. And as, I'd say, uh, as I've said in the past, uh, or more recently, that um, we would certainly want to hold um, any um, wayward individuals to account. If there was any uh, profiteering or anyone who would have done anything that would have caused um, additional um, harm or cost to accrue to the public account. As the costs rack up and the clock ticks, cabinet and the public will be keenly watching whether this new completion timeline will be met. Garfield Burford, ABS News. Now, in an ABS News follow-up about the shortage of sand locally for the construction industry, the government says a building boom in the country has triggered the shortage of the critical input. The cabinet discussed the issue yesterday and confirmed that the importation of the product from Guyana will become the norm. Here again is Garfield Burford. 
The cabinet indicated that demand for building materials is at an all-time high amidst a surge in construction activities. It indicated that it's not only sand that is being used in high volumes, but cement, steel, and wood as well. There is a huge demand for uh, products that uh, public works are going to produce from the, the quarries. And um, even now as we speak, the two major projects that they have before them would be the airport in Barbuda, the new airport in Barbuda, and the two uh, major highway projects that have been done on Frasil Road and the Sir George Walter Highway. Um, that's going to have the, the optimal attention of the public works for the foreseeable months, the rest of this year presumably, and certainly the better part of next year. Uh, we have seen that there has been um, a greater demand for, for cement than what the traditional suppliers have been able to accomplish. In relation to sand, Minister Nicholas says there is a shortage locally, even with supplies coming from Barbuda. The council itself has indicated that there is a limited amount of harvestable sand um, from the mines in Barbuda, or from the, the areas that sand is being mined from. I think there have been certain ecological challenges that have uh, presented themselves. Um, one of the options that had been discussed is going offshore to some sand dunes that are subsea. Um, but that will also increase, um, uh, introduce a factor of um, washing that particular sand because of the salt content, which would not be uh, conducive in its immediate form for construction. It has therefore required imports from Guyana, a story ABS News reported about a month ago. Maurice Construction and G. Omar Construction and Equipment, along with other Antiguans, are among the importers with whom we spoke. In addition to Guyana, stakeholders in the construction industry have looked to other tariffs to import sand, including Dominica and Montserrat. I asked Minister Nicholas whether the government may also need to do its own importation of sand to augment supplies for the local market. Should we get to a position where the other aggregate that is required, sand, um, does not arrive here in insufficient quantities, then maybe the government would have to look at, uh, if there are not sufficient local private sector suppliers, maybe the government may have to look at bringing in some sand for itself. But we have not um, yet reached that, that particular um, decision point. The government hasn't reached that bridge yet, but private contractors are already in the mix. There is clearly a move to lay a concrete foundation for the continued expansion of the construction sector. Geoffrey Burford, ABS News. There's a clarion call from the acting police commissioner for more focus on improving the state of police facilities nationwide. Atli Rodney notes that the country lags behind in the area of its police infrastructure and an injection of funds is needed. Jessica Russell has that story. Acting Commissioner Ronnie says police stations are in need of major upgrades. You look at even some of the rented properties we have as police stations. This is not the ideal. And I, and I, I think there comes a time that Security is not cheap, and I think there will come a time where we have to make that hard decision and provide the necessary infrastructure and the resources for security. He says the state of facilities used by police is a cause for concern, especially when compared with other public buildings. You look at our police station, and if you take another, you look at the school, some of the schools are looking much more prettier than our police station, and I think it's time that security is not cheap, but it's necessary because without it, everything else falls apart. So I, I think it's, it's something that the policymakers have to look at down in the road that we need decent police station, we need different, decent infrastructure so that they can operate. Acting Commissioner Ronnie says sometimes it may not be an issue of the availability of funds, but how those funds are spent. Jessica Russell, ABS News. Now, the public should soon be provided with an update on the investigations of harassment allegations against suspended police commissioner Wendell Robinson. That's the latest from the man acting in the post, Atlee Rodney. He was responding to questions on whether an independent investigator had been engaged by the police to carry out the probe. Persons has been identified. I think we have made quite a um, progress on that. And I think in, in short notice, I think much more information would be made available. So an investigator has been identified. But there, there, there is a lot of progress in that. Commissioner Robinson was suspended by the Police Service Commission in April amidst allegations against him by three junior male officers. He has since filed an action in the court to challenge the action of the PSC, arguing that his right to natural justice was infringed. The High Court is set to hear arguments in the matter tomorrow. 
Now, in a follow-up on our own reporting, CEO of the Antigua and Barbuda Tourism Authority, Colin James, has credited a total team effort for the record increase in arrivals for the first half of the year. Tourism officials released figures this week showing a significant increase in arrivals from major source markets. And Eli Bird sought reactions from Mr. James. We do apologize for the missing audio on that report. We will get back to it at a later time. Now, the Antigua Public Utilities Authority, APUA, is calling for other companies to join in blood donation initiatives. The APUA partnered with Club Life, an organization aimed at raising blood supplies at the Mount St. John's Medical Center. Club Life's van, which allows the nonprofit organization to reach out to potential blood donors, was parked at the APUA's High Street headquarters on Thursday. Lyle Jackson, an APUA employee, emphasized how crucial this initiative is. We think it's also a duty, of course, to be a part, an active part of society, of course, trying to give back. Um, giving blood is very important. Um, you know, when you need blood, you could save your very own life by giving blood. If possible, we would like other, you know, corporate companies, of course, to do the same thing, try to mimic what we're doing here and try to help, you know, society in a whole. One of the coordinators for Club Life's blood drives, Roland Moore, also stressed the life-saving nature of this effort. It is something that is not just needed when we hear the appeals going out, but it's something that's needed you know, for cancer patients, for dialysis patients, for um, the maternity ward. There's about every aspect. Um, one in six persons who go to the Mount St. John Medical Center will need blood. And so we want to ensure that the blood is there on hand um, so that individuals, their lives can be saved. Jackson and Miss APUA 2018 Kajana White were among APUA workers who gave blood. This is the second year APUA has partnered with Club Life. Now Antigua is playing host to a meeting of yet another global grouping. Uh, delegates from the World Federation of Methodists and Uniting Church Women are holding a, a high-level confab at the Jolly Beach Resort. Uh, women from around the Caribbean are among those who are focused on the Christian woman's role in society. Jessica Russell reports on the opening ceremony at Jolly Beach Resort and Spa earlier today. The conference will equip women with ways to help their countries develop. President of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, Lois Hector, provided more details. In this session, these sessions, we focus on sections of the Millennium Goals, Sustainable Goals for Development. Each territory will later focus on the one that is most significant or in need for their territory. Susan Mathias, who delivered the welcome, said women play a very important role in society. She used the biblical reference to emphasize this. And I want to remind you ladies that it was not mere luck that Mary was the first person to know that the Lord was risen from the dead. God knew that the gospel had to be spread. And he wanted it done in an efficient and timely manner. Amen. And so he chose a woman to be the first spreader of the gospel. Gender Affairs Minister, the Honorable Samantha Marshall, also encouraged the woman. I say to you today as women of the region, be proud of your story and be eager to tell and share your story. Because our stories shape our families, they shape our communities. They shape the relations within our church. And they also help to mold and shape our countries. The women also joined in song and prayer. The conference ends on Monday. Jessica Russell, EBS News. Now the finalists have been decided for the Flow Party Monarch competition following an intense semifinal showdown Wednesday night into this morning. Artists in the groovy and jumpy segments sought to sing their way into the finals and into the hearts of the Soka fans. Here's more in this report from Sherilyn Biza. It was a riveting contest with 15 competing for a place on the stage in the groovy finals. Shortly after one Thursday morning, the six finalists were announced. The finalists go in to challenge for the groovy monarch will be... Claudette Peters, Essie Rattigan, Kimmy, 
Lyrics man, Menace and Zamoni. We jamming on anything that in reach. We whining on anything that ever we said. Champion bubble up. Anywhere you go, boom, look at your beer. The way you move in, your waist can't be in the face, move me, tormented it. There were also 15 competing for a place in the finals of the Jumpy segment. The six finalists were also announced early Thursday morning. The finalists who will be challenging for the Jumpy Monarch goes as follow Claudette Peters, DJ Who. Lyrics man, Menace, Tion Winter, and Zamoni. Lelis, Lelis, they put me on the list. Lelis, Lelis, sing. Now I'm famous. Drop up with a pen, chip up with a pen. Bring up a tear, man. Look up a tear. When we touch up, everything that sells up. When we touch up, everything that sells up. It's the same set with us, smash up what's it? Can't do nothing, be a sick, none that we at all. It's the same set, just wind up today. We think like a body, then you know who to call. Take your rock hand, stick out your rock hand. Hi, sing your back hand. Hi, sing out your back hand. Hi, take your thing out. Hi, stick out your thing out. Hi. The six finalists in each category will form the Sensational Seven, along with the Monarch. The finalists will be seeking to unseat reigning Groovy Monarch Tian Winter and Jumpy Monarch Ricardo Drew. The winners in both segments will receive $50,000. $40,000 goes to the first runner-up, while second runner-up will receive $30,000. All unplaced contestants will receive $8,000. The Flow Party Monarch will be staged on Sunday, the 5th of August at Carnival City. Sherilyn Beza reporting for ABS News. Thanks, Sherilyn. Uh, interesting stuff happened over there at the ARG last evening. Yeah, you Congratulations. Guys having, you guys were having a ball up there. Yeah, we were. Okay. Congratulations to the six from each category who were selected. And of course, we look forward to seeing what you bring on the finals night. The Sensational Seven will hit the stage. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, here's where we take our first commercial break. For those of you viewing on Facebook Live, don't go far. Sports is next. Antigua and Barbuda girls uh, tennis players continue their dominance in Trinidad. Also coming up this evening, we'll have regional and international developments. You're watching the ABS Evening News. Stay with us. <laughs> 